take your Bibles and we will look at Colossians chapter 1. Here I want to look at two verses here this afternoon. Charles Spurgeon was trying to find the actual quote where he said this in his lectures to his students, but he said he did not like preaching after meals because the potatoes and gravy sat upon their, their constitution in such a way as to render them utterly um, just out of it. So uh, we, are, we are up against it uh, this afternoon, but I trust that the Lord will give us energy and help us to, to pay attention to his word. just want to look at two verses here. I'm going to give you some context, but the most, the most of our message will be looking at these two verses, verses 13 and 14. Colossians chapter 1, we'll start in verse 9 just to get our, our feet under us again. Paul says, for this reason, and that reason is that he had heard of their faith and love, which sprang out of the hope that they had in Christ. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to just ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Or I like the way the King James Version puts it, His, his dear Son, His beloved Son is the idea here, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Let's ask the Lord to meet with us this afternoon. Lord, we come to You and we bring... Uh, these verses before you, Lord, we ask that you would open our minds, open our hearts to receive them, and may we understand what it is you have for us today. Thank you, Lord, for the truths that are here. Pray that they would impact our hearts as you desire them to. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We learned last time we looked at these verses that a Colossian testimony is only the beginning. Paul prayed for the Colossians that they would walk worthy of the Lord. And walking worthy, we said, is the ultimate standard of the Christian life. Nothing else really matters. Uh, it doesn't matter how much money you had, how successful you are, how many friends you have, how many backflips you can do, how strong you are. Uh, the only thing that matters is if your life is worthy of the Lord Jesus. That's the only standard for the Christian life. Walking worthy is a stewardship of God's will. We need to be not only know His will, we need to be controlled by His will. It needs to thrive through our lives and utterly master us. Uh, walking worthy is an ongoing transformation by God's grace. When we're controlled by His will, He is going to transform our lives. And we saw that uh, we're going to be fruitful, we'll increase through the knowledge of God, we'll be strengthened with patience, with joy, and we're going to be thankful to God for qualifying us for this inheritance. And I want to take a little bit of time and expand on that uh, we just touched on it last time. An inheritance typically refers to what? Is it physical things, right? Okay, so uh, assets, um, money, um, bank accounts, that's, that's what an inheritance typically refers to. In the spiritual sense, the inheritance refers to that which is determined for someone. So what is determined for me as a Christian? Uh, what is determined for you as a Christian? And that inheritance that is determined for me as a Christian doesn't begin when I get to heaven. That inheritance begins right now. We're to, we're to give thanks to the Father who has qualified us for that inheritance. This life is a part of it. It's a part of my inheritance uh, living this life in fellowship with the Lord and being rewarded for it is a part of my spiritual inheritance. That's what we get to do. Uh, Pastor touched on this this morning that we need to live our lives for eternity because that's, I mean, we get this one, one shot at it, basically. We get this one opportunity to live this window of time, 80, 90, uh, 100 years for the glory of God, and then it's over. We we, we enjoy eternity forever, but the, the 80, 90, 100 years on this life that we get to live by faith in the Lord is, a, it is an incredible gift if you really think about it. But that starts now. My whole point is the inheritance starts 
Now, it's like you're planning a wonderful vacation with your wife and family. How many have taken vacation before? I, we need everything we can to stay awake here. So um, you're, you're plan, taking vacation before, all right, and you plan your vacation, and you're looking forward to your destination. But if you love your wife and your family, the journey to your destination ought to be a part of the vacation as well, should it not? It, it should. How many of you, though, that has not been the case in your life? It's like, be quiet. We're just getting there. I don't care if you have to go to the bathroom. Just, you know, you know. and it, there's, there's, a, there's an impatience in our heart. Anybody else like that sometimes tends, tends to be? Yes. Okay, we're in a hurry. And the gas station's like, all right, let's see if we can beat our time last. You know, it's a five minutes, you know, four and a half. Let's see if we can get back in the car. Four and a half minutes. And, you know, people are just, uh, it, it's not restful, you <laughs> know. Um, when we, when we went to Maine this, this past summer, just determined, I had, to, I had to psych myself up for this because I'm one of those people that likes to get there. It's 24 hours to Maine. You have to, you have to split it up. So we're going to get a hotel. We're going to stop and we're going to do fun stuff. We're going to go see Gettysburg and we're going to do this. You know, it was, it was a very enjoyable vacation because we just took our time and we stopped and we ate and, and it was not rushed at all. Now, there were times still that it was like, we need to get to the hotel by this amount of time because we reserved it and we've paid and blah, 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 blah. But the idea here is enjoy the journey of getting there. The inheritance starts now. Enjoy the journey of getting to when you, when you get to be with Jesus forever in his presence. The inheritance starts now. To walk worthy of the Lord is what he's dealing with here. And walking worthy in this life is a part of our inheritance. The concept he uses in verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, the idea here is to balance the scales. You played on the seesaws in elementary school, probably. Maybe you have fond memories of seesaws. Maybe you have terrifying memories of seesaws. Uh, because somebody on the other end weighed three times as much as you did and they jumped on the other end and you went flying into the air and sent you into orbit or something. And it's, that's the nature of seesaws when they're not balanced. Well, we're to balance the scales. On one side of the scale is God. On the other side is our life. The scales should balance as we live a life consistent with verses 12 through 14. Something within us, though, may cry out, this, this is not, I can't do this. I can't live a life that balances the scale. You talk about my inheritance, that I get to live a life that balances the scale for 80 years. How on earth can I do that? I struggle just getting up in the morning. I struggle with keeping my, keeping my worry checked. And I struggle with all these different things. How can I live a life that is worthy of the Lord? No believer has any grounds to say what we may have just said. None of us. Because we are, as the title of the message says, we are qualified. We balance the scales by realizing how God has qualified us for this task and by celebrating it for the rest of our lives, stewarding His will and being transformed by His grace. That's how you do it. God knows that you're not worthy of it, but He's qualified you. He's qualified you. He's qualified me. Everyone here today needs to realize and embrace the fact that you're qualified to live a life worthy of Jesus Christ. I know you can't do it. We're not talking about you, though. We're talking about him. Perhaps you say, you don't know me. I'm a mess. Again, we're not talking about us. We're talking about him. Think of a physical inheritance for a moment. Um. To get a physical inheritance, let's say it's several million dollars. What essential element is necessary to be able to receive an inheritance of a million dollars? Can you go apply online for an inheritance of a million dollars? Probably you can do anything online, so I shouldn't ask that. But can you, can you get, there are people in, in uh, different countries that try to get you to apply for inheritances for a million dollars, but um, spam email. But can you apply for an inheritance? You can't. What do you, have to, what do you have to have to get an inheritance for millions of dollars? Somebody has to have the inheritance. And what key factor has to be true about that person? 
They have to die, that's true. What else? <laughs> Let's not talk about that too much. Yes? In most cases, they're related, In most cases, they're related to you, okay? And they have to like you. <laughs> yes, yes, they have to be willing to give it. But they have to be related to you generally. There's, there's that stipulation most often, yes. Another... Yes, they have, to, they have to will it to you. But generally, this is, this is dealing with family members. You have to be related to that person in some sort of way or a dear friend or, or something like that. There has to be a relationship that is the grounds for that inheritance. If you carry that over into the spiritual side of things, we had no relationship with God. But God has qualified us for an inheritance. He's written us into his will. He has, he has given us two things that we're going to look at to be qualified for this task. We have been, number one, rescued from the power of darkness. Verse 12 says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. The idea of delivered us is the idea of rescuing. He's rescued us. Think about it. How many times does rescuing someone mean drawing them to yourself? If you're in a boat, let's make me in the boat. You're drowning. I'm in a boat. I want to be in the boat. Okay, so I'm going to save you. What do I have to do? Don't say jump in the water because the water is cold. I don't want to jump in the water. What do I need to do? I need to pull you in. I need to throw you something, and you need to grab it. I need to have a life preserver or something, and I throw it to you. You grab it, and I pull you to me. If, if I'm stuck in a pit and you are going to rescue me, you're probably not going to climb down in the pit. You're going to throw me a rope and I'm going to tie it to myself and you're going to pull me to yourself. Think about how many times rescuing involves bringing someone out of where they're at and to yourself. It says he has rescued us and the idea of that word is he's drawn us to himself. Where were we? We were in the power of darkness. The word power is the word that is translated authority or dominion or rule in the New Testament. There was a power here in this, this kingdom. It says that he's delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. There's a, there's a connection between kingdom and power. So there's two, there's two kingdoms here, is it, if, it, if you will, and the power is this rule, this realm, this dominion. And it's the power of darkness. What is this power of darkness, this kingdom of darkness? We need to see that the power of this kingdom of darkness is derived from something specific. It's derived from the guilt of sin. What makes the world so powerful is the guilt of sin. When an unbeliever sins... Guilt fills his heart because he's broken God's law that is written upon his conscience. T go to Romans chapter 2 quickly. Romans chapter 2. Paul is talking about the Gentiles here. And he is saying that the Gentiles who do not know the law do by nature the things that are contained in the law. And these having not the law are a law unto themselves which show the work of God written on their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, it says. Verse 15, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and, their, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. This goes on in the hearts of every Gentile person. We know the law of God. It's written in our hearts. There's something that's programmed within us. Now, there's this moral compass there. And God has lit our conscience. And it, when an unbeliever sins... He knows that he's wrong. We don't have to argue with people about the robbery and the moral, um, moral properties of, of robbing or murder. Everyone knows instinctively that's terrible, that's wrong. His mind and conscience, when, a believer, when an unbeliever sins, his mind and conscience knows that he's the enemy of God by wicked works. Colossians 1.21, we're going to get to that eventually here um, as we study through it. We were enemies of God in our mind by wicked works. 
And this person, this unbeliever, seeks to drown out the guilt. Now, how does he drown out the guilt? Give me some ways he drowns out the guilt. He can use alcohol. He can just throw himself right back into the sin and do more of it. It's sort of like Mexican food. You know, when you get, it starts to burn, you just eat more of it. You know? and, and eventually you've got to stop and it really sets your mouth on fire. Um, and it's, it's this idea of, of he drowns out, he's seeking to drown out the guilt with more sin or with alcohol or with any number of distracting things. Or there's another possibility. He can own his guilt and seek to remove it with an attempt at righteousness. How do you think that's going to go for an unbeliever to attempt righteousness? In his attempt at righteousness, he's going to completely fail and the guilt's going to compound. He's going to know that inside, he may, he may be right on the outside, but on the inside, what he's thinking about can't be pleasing. And God has to be able to see that. His heart's going to tell him that. You ever, you ever said one thing and thought another? I mean, and we know the Lord. How, how much more an unsaved person that, that doesn't know the Lord saying one thing, thinking another, and knowing that deep in our heart there's this, there's this wickedness. And these sins and attempts at righteousness are going to bring on God's wrath which abides on that man. And without God's help or direction, the man is trapped with his sin. And sin controls his life by condemning him. It's a hook. Once he sins, he's guilty. The guilt has to be dealt with. He's got two ways to go. He can either try at righteousness, which fails, or he can go around and sin again, which produces more guilt. And there's this spiral thing going. And eventually, this man's going to behave himself straight to hell. He cannot produce the righteousness of God. And sin controls his life. It, it's his identity. That's what he lives with. I follow the news articles sometimes and the headlines and some of these people and the things that they go through and the ways that they try to cope with their sin and cope with the things that go into their life and you just feel for them because you know that at the end of that, there's not fulfillment. They have millions of dollars, they have position, they have fame and they're, they're hopeless. Sin controls their life by condemning them. And the power of the kingdom of darkness is built on that principle. It controls us, it controls unbelievers by condemning them. It also is derived from fear of death. Go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. You say, what does this have to do with me? Well, Christians can be controlled by the kingdom of darkness still. We can still give over control of our lives to this. And sin, if we don't know how to deal with it, sin will, sin will hook into our lives. Sin will control our lives by its power to separate us from God. It will become our identity. It will work its way into who we are. Hebrews 2 and verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power over, of death, that is the devil, and look at verse 15. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to what? Bondage. The power of this kingdom of darkness is from the fear of death. They get, it gets, it derives its power from the fear of death. The wages of sin is what? Death. Paul says, we've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. He equates fear with bondage. And this is the same concept as the ensnaring guilt of sin. And now the fear of the consequences of one's sin drives him to drown out. It's like he's, he's going over a waterfall. How many have been to Niagara Falls? You get close to Niagara Falls through Buffalo there and you can see this cloud rising. And it's like, what is that? And you get to think, well, that's, that must be the waterfalls. And as you get close to the waterfalls, this deafening roar just gets louder and louder and louder. And if you imagine yourself in this boat on the Niagara River headed for Niagara Falls, the roar is getting louder and louder and louder. And it's certain death if you go over those falls. And it's like the world is going towards that judgment and fear of death 
is getting louder and louder and louder, and this deafening roar is taking over their lives. And what are they doing? They're trying to, they're trying to drown it out. They've got their earbuds in. They've got their headphones on. They're trying to make noise. They don't want to think about it. They literally don't want to think about it. It's crazy. You would never look at someone in a boat going over Niagara Falls and say, do you want some help? You say, no, nah, I, I, I try not to think about it. Are you, are you sure? <laughs> but that's what the world is. That's what they think about, they, or they don't think about. They don't want to think about death. They're afraid of it, and they're subject to bondage. That's the kingdom of darkness that we're dealing with. One last thing about it. It's ruled by someone. Who's ruling it? Satan is ruling it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, says that we have been quickened. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. It says that we once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. This kingdom of darkness has a course. It's like a train track. My brother and I, when we were growing up, we got a train. I forget who bought it for us or whatever, but we used to play with that train. We used to make the train go wherever we want it to do, and uh, we'd get creative with it and we'd turn the little, the little thing on and we'd make it fall off the trestle sometimes probably. And we're just trying to amuse ourselves. And we could set up that train to do whatever we wanted it to do. Satan has set up the course of this world like a train track. And the world thinks they're in control. They're walking according to the course of this world. So it's the kingdom of darkness. And what has God done back in Colossians? He has delivered us. He's rescued us from the, from the kingdom of darkness. The, Bible, the uh, Colossians says that the Father's plan is to reconcile all things to himself through the body of Christ. Back over in Colossians chapter 1. Verse, look at verse 19. This is skipping ahead a little bit here. Colossians 1, 19. For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself. By Him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, heaven having made peace through the blood of His cross. God wants to reconcile everything to himself. And you get the idea that he's pulling everything to himself, like you would rescue someone drowning or stuck in the mud or whatever. You're pulling them to yourself. God is rescuing us. So we are rescued from the power of darkness. How is this possible? This is possible by his beloved son. And that's the second thing we need to see here. We are reassigned to the kingdom of God's beloved Son. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us, has transferred us, has reassigned us into the kingdom of His beloved Son. Christ is God's beloved Son. What did God say of Jesus when He was baptized? Do you remember Matthew chapter 3? This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. What did, Christ, what did God say of Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter wanted to build tabernacles for Christ and Moses and Elijah? What did, he want, what did God say to them at that point? This is my beloved son. Hear him. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. I won't turn for time here, but Isaiah chapter 42 says, Behold my servant, my elect, in whom my soul delights. This is my beloved son. And in this passage, God is calling Jesus his dear beloved son. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, it says that we're made accepted in the beloved one. None of this rescue from the darkness is possible without God's beloved son. Not only that, but we have redemption in God's beloved son. This is where it really gets exciting. We have redemption through His beloved Son. Verse 14, in whom we have redemption. Redemption is deliverance by the payment of a ransom. This ransom was paid in Christ's blood. First Peter, first Peter chapter 1, verse 18 
tells us that we were not redeemed by corruptible things as silver and gold. But with the, from your aimless conduct received from tradition for your, from your fathers. But 19, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. We're not redeemed with corruptible things. God has paid the ransom for us, not in gold. Now, that would be, I mean, honestly, if somebody said, you know what, I just paid $50 million for your release. Well, at least I'm that valuable to somebody. <laughs> God said the amount of gold in all the world is not enough to pay our ransom. What did he, what did he pay our ransom with? The precious blood of his only son. That's how valuable I am to the Lord. That's how valuable you are to the Lord. We're redeemed with his blood. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul says that they should take, they should take oversight of the flock of God which he had purchased with his own blood. Go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. This ransom was not paid to Satan. Some people say, well, the ransom was paid to Satan. Satan was in no position to demand anything like that of God. The ransom is a payment to satisfy the righteous wrath of God. Isaiah 53 verse 4 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Look at verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Who, who did it please? The Lord. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin... He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. God has redeemed us not with corruptible things like silver or gold. He's, he's redeemed us with his own blood. We have redemption in God's beloved son. Secondly, we have remission of sins in God's beloved son. Remission of sins. Back in Colossians chapter 1, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of of sins. The word here literally means to send away. It refers to the removal of guilt. It's used two times in Luke chapter 4 verse 18 and I want to read that to you. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. Jesus is in the temple in the synagogue here and he's handed the prophet Isaiah and he opened the book and he found the place where it was written, <clears throat> Luke 4, 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Can you guess which word is translated forgiveness in that passage? There are two times it's, it occurs. It wouldn't be something that stands out to us. It's the word liberty. To proclaim liberty to the captives. Liberty. And he's going to explain it more in Colossians in just a moment. But liberty to the captives and liberty to those oppressed. There's something that's oppressing us before we're saved. And God sets us at liberty. Paul's going to explain this back in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. Skipping ahead again, Colossians 2.13. You need to see this, I believe, with your, with your eyes. Colossians 2.13. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Now, how many of you have seen those things that the kids play with? I think they call them boogie boards, but they, they scribble on these boards, and you can draw this magnificent picture on there. And it, it is stunning, and it takes all this work, and one of your siblings can come up and literally 
push a button and it's gone. Never to, I mean, there's no hard drive, there's no memory on those things. It's gone. I mean, all that work, you could spend hours and it's gone. It says he wiped out the handwriting of ordinances. The idea here is that the handwriting of ordinances is a certificate of indebtedness. It's a big fancy word for an IOU, another fancy word for a mortgage statement. (laughs) It's how much you owe God, and it wasn't pretty. And it's like Jesus came up, and he just pushed the button on that thing, and it's gone. It's gone. He wiped it clean. You can't recover it. It's nowhere. It, It belongs to nowhere. It is gone. He's wiped our statement clean. There's there's nothing there anymore. He took it out of the way. He goes on. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. He's nailed it to his cross. He suffered for our sins, and he's taken away the guilt of my sin. And you remember what I said about the power of this kingdom of darkness? Where does it come from? It comes from several things. Do you remember one of them? It comes from the guilt of sin. It, it ensnares us because when we sin, we feel guilty. To get rid of our guilt, we have to go do something. We either try to be right or we try to drown out the guilt of the sin with what? More sin. And it's just ensnaring. It gets all over our lives and it's, it traps us. The other thing that constitutes this kingdom is the fear of death. We don't want to face eternity. We don't like to face eternity. And the whole world system is built on that. It's it's ruled by the prince of darkness. And if it's all run on that and there's no way to get out, what do you think would happen if Jesus Christ actually makes a way to get out? It says that he has, look at verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers. Sin no more is addicting. There's an escape. You don't have to feel guilt when you sin anymore. Well, doesn't that mean you can go sin all you want? Yes, you could. But why on earth would you want to do that? Why on earth would you want to continue to do something that has ruined your life for the past however many years? Why on earth would you want to continue to give uh, service to this kingdom? He's made a way out. He's taken away the hook, the binding nature of that kingdom. He spoiled principalities and powers. And it says he made a public spectacle of them. They actually looked like fools for all of their craftiness. Jonathan Edwards wrote of Satan, Although the devil be exceedingly crafty and subtle, yet he is one of the greatest fools and blockheads in the world, as the subtlest of wicked men are. (laughs) He's one of the greatest fools and blockheads in the world. That's what Jonathan Edwards said. Satan's been beat, folks. He he has no power over our lives. God has made a way that we don't have to serve him anymore. He spoiled principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So, what does this all mean to us? What shall we say? There are five questions that Paul asks in Romans chapter 8. I'd like you to turn there as we close. Romans chapter 8. Verse 31, these are all questions that cannot be answered. It's like he just hurls them out. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? You can't answer that question. What's the answer? The idea is, who are you going to present that could actually legitimately be against me if God's for me? What's the answer? Nobody. Nobody can be against me. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If God gave me Jesus, he's not going to withhold anything from me. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? If I'm God's elect, no one can bring a charge against me. Sin can't stick in my life. Yes, I could go out and commit a sin, an addicting sin. And I could get addicted to sin, but it would be by my choice. There's no power that is going to control my life now that Jesus is inhabiting my life. 
Shall we sin? Shall we sin? Um, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul says, No, God forbid. We could continue in sin, but it's crazy. Why would you do? God forbid that you should come to that conclusion. And he's saying, Sin does not have to govern my life. It doesn't have to rule me anymore. It, God's broken the chains. You can walk out of jail. Who is he who condemns those who trust in Christ? Who is he who condemneth? It's Christ that died. If Christ has died and risen for me, then no one else can condemn me. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. So what do we do? What does God want us to do with this passage? We need to walk worthy of this standing in Christ. You need to celebrate the fact that Christ has qualified you for His inheritance. You're qualified. You're justified. You need to be controlled by the knowledge of Christ's will this week. Find His will and do it. So, some of, just to be frank, some of us folks are still sitting in this stinking jail. We're sitting in a stinking jail and we're saying, I wish I could stop doing this. I wish I could stop sinning. I wish I could stop struggling with this. And this passage on a Sunday afternoon, has just thrown the key of promise into your jail cell. It came through the slotted window. Did you see it? It goes plink, plink, plink on the ground. There it is. You can pick it up. You can stick it in the door, and you can walk out of jail this week. You don't have to live there anymore. I don't have to live there anymore. Sin doesn't have to have its effect. It doesn't have to stick its tentacles, its tentacles, its talons in our lives, tentacles and talons maybe. You know, It doesn't have to stick into our lives and control us anymore. Christ has liberated us. We're qualified to share the inheritance of the saints and lights. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Walk worthy of that. Walk in a manner that is in keeping with that. When temptation seems too strong to bear this week, realize that Christ has already nailed to His cross the very sin you're tempted to commit. It's already nailed to the cross. He took away its power to control your life. Remember that Christ's blood has sprinkled your life. You've been rescued from Satan's kingdom. Take the moment of temptation as an opportunity. Use it as a platform on which to glorify God who reassigned you to the kingdom of His beloved Son. In other words, the temptation comes, and let's say a temptation to lust, the temptation to shade the truth, a temptation to get impatient with somebody. It doesn't have to rule your life. You can actually stand on that temptation and use it as a platform and say, not even this is going to rule my life. By the, by the grace of God, not even this is going to rule my life. I could choose to do this and God would forgive me for it, but the fact that God will forgive me for it is the very reason I choose not to. I'm going to honor Him by choosing not to because He's empowered me to do that. And His, His deliverance can run, can rule our life. Look to the Lord for the strength to remain joyfully patient in difficulty. Be controlled by the knowledge of His will. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. Translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. You need to live like that this week. We need to live like that. That needs to mark our lives. That's our identity. And if we struggle this week, we need to come back to that and allow the Lord to fill us with that knowledge. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you. We thank you for this passage. Thank you for the power that is here. Lord, open our minds to this. Open our spirits. Convict us, Lord, of our failure to live in this reality. I pray that we would know the grace that you can give that would mark our lives forever as a result of this identity in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to sing 478. We're going to sing the second and third verses of this song. It is well with my soul. My sin, all oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, the third verse. We'll sing the third verse. But the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Let's stand. Verse 3, 478. My sin, O oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin. Oh. 